everyone, and welcome to your daily Barnes Takeout. My name is Carl Walsh. I am a postdoctoral fellow in the Department of Research, Interpretation and Education here at the Barnes. And today I wanted to take you to a case that I've been particularly missing at the moment because I'm used to seeing this every day um, at the museum when I'm walking to my workspace in the library. And so this is something that's kind of like intimately part of my daily life at work, which I'm currently very much missing. So as you can see, this is a big glass case full of uh, Pueblo ceramics and Pueblo and uh, Navajo jewelry. And it's really this incredible case that I really just love to come down and have a look at um, when I'm on a break or when I'm having my lunch um, and just sit and have a look at it because it's full of these wonderful colors and patterns and designs that I think really nicely kind of contrast and engage with the stone background behind the case as well. Um, and I just find these really interesting and really engaging. So um, it's something I, I wanted to share um, as well. And today I wanted to talk about a particular vessel that is in this case. And this is um, on the top uh, right hand side um, of the case, uh, right here, and this little vessel is really, really nice, and I, and I have a real connection to this one as well because I've spent a couple of times actually just sitting in front of it and sketching it a little bit um, because I really just enjoy the patterns on it and the, and the colors and things as well, and uh, it's kind of black and white coloration works well for just a sketch. Um, so here it is up close, um, and I think my interest in this vessel probably mirrors in a lot of ways what Barnes was interested in about these ceramics as well. Um, and he came to know these artworks, particularly through his visits um, to the American Southwest in the early 1930s. And this came about mostly because his wife, Laura Barnes, uh, had been having some problems with a sinus condition and her doctor prescribed her to take some time somewhere warm and dry that would help with um, recovery from this, uh, from this complication that she was having. And so the Barneses decided uh, to go and have a visit around the area of Phoenix and uh, Santa Fe in New Mexico. Um, and they also went to Arizona as well. Um, and Laura was very opposed to this. She, she really had to be kind of like forced to go. Um, and she stayed out there for a couple of months and, and Barnes went out there for about, about three weeks um, and then continued to be in touch with obviously with his wife as she was staying there as well. So he came to know and to be introduced to all of the wonderful Southwestern Native American arts, such as you know tapestry weaving and blanket making, ceramics and jewelry. Um, and he was also kind of introduced into the local art circles here as well, who also um, were producing kind of wonderful pieces of art. Um, and Santa, the area around Santa Fe today continues to be a hotspot for kind of artistic works and for Native American art um, as well. So um, it's a really good place to go visit today as well. Um, what I like about Barnes's interest in these ceramics as well was that he was very much interested in, in obviously the very appealing decoration that's on them, but also he was interested in the kind of the human aspect to them as well. When he was selecting ceramics to buy, he wasn't just looking at the decoration, but he was looking for things that were that were damaged and that were used and have this kind of sense of a human use to them as well. So they're not just kind of things that are art, but also things that are human. And as an archaeologist, I obviously really am also interested in that as well. And I and I find that really interesting about, you know, what he found engaging about these objects. And I think it also adds something really interesting visually to them as well. I mean, if you look at this pot, you can see that at the top, um, it has this kind of, you know, damaged and um, kind of broken uh, rim, which I think really nicely kind of contrasts in terms of its kind of texture and its its silhouette as well with the the decoration that is on the body as well. So I think it's it creates this really interesting kind of contrast between kind of um, smooth and regular lines and you know broken and irregular lines as well. Um, so I think this is probably why he was also interested in you know finding things that had damage on them as well. 
But in terms of the decoration, um, this can be quite, I know when I first looked at this type of art, it can be quite overwhelming. It looks really complex. But actually, a lot of the ceramics feature very simple types of iconography, um, only dealing with maybe one or two subjects. Um, and often for these types of jars, there are things that connect to the natural world, particularly to wind and water, which are obviously really important life-giving aspects to Southwestern American communities, uh, particularly access to water. And so the decoration on these actually alludes to different kind of ideas about water. Um, and at the top here around the neck, we actually have a series of stylized renderings of rainbirds. And through their kind of curving beaks like this and their, and their plumage, they're kind of really evoking a sense of the movement and fluidity and kind of swirling nature of water and wind. Um, and really trying to kind of take you and evoke to you to these kind of instances of when rain and water is appearing in the environment. Um, and even in things like these little hatchings and parallel lines, um, they kind of evoke senses of like curtains of rain and, and droplets of rain appearing out of the sky and things. Um, so they're very kind of evocative, um, I think, as well. And the body decoration is also very distinctive as well because it, it also has this rainbird motif, um, but this one is really sprawling. It moves all across and around the body. And it really kind of gets you to think about looking at the, in the entire object. You kind of want to follow around it and, and to look and see how all these patterns are uh, interlocking and how they're changing. And there's so much kind of asymmetry to it as well that you know everything is different. Every time you move it around, you see something different and new. Uh, and not repetitive, um, which is which is interesting. Um, and again, similar kind of techniques for evoking things like water with like these hatched lines and parallel lines um, and the use of, you know, kind of triangles and things to kind of get this sense of like the movement of water um, falling um, as well. So this is a really interesting way that they kind of, um, the, the Zuni Pueblo peoples are kind of evoking the sense of the changeable movement in nature of wind and water um, and linking it in with their own beliefs of kind of mythology and cosmology. Um, and a lot of these jars would actually be very utilitarian in nature. They would be designed for collecting water, often by women. Um, but they could also be highly ceremonial in nature and very kind of important players in Zuni Pueblo ceremonies as well. So they have this interesting dual nature of being, you know, something utilitarian, but also something really special as well. And of course, the theme of rain and water is also expressed through the materiality of the of the object as well. It's made from clay, um, and obviously, to to form it, you need to actually interact with water in kind of shaping it and adding water to it. So it inherently has this kind of water aspect about it anyway, because of just the material that it's made from. Um, and of course, like the paint and pigments as well, and the slip that is used to decorate it um, and color it are all use water as well. So it has this kind of inherent waterness about it as well, which I think is, is great to think about as well. Um, Obviously, the form is also specifically meant to hold water. You can just look at it. You can see it has this big bulbous body, um, which is meant to contain all this liquid within it. And then it tapers towards the top and towards the rim so that it uh, has more of a closed mouth, which you know prevents things from spilling out of it easily. Um, and the big bulbous body gives it like stability as well with all that weight of the water that's in it too. So the form of the of the vessel is also inherently you know related to water um, as well. Um, so you get this lovely engage, engagement and I think kind of interconnectedness between the materials, the making, the form, its function. Um, and, and the decoration as well very much relates to this too. And I think it really helps to um, highlight the importance of rain and water and wind uh, to the Zuni Pueblo peoples. So I hope you enjoyed this Barnes takeout. Um, and when your next 
in the museum, please come and go and take some time to have a look in this case in the lower lobby. It's outside of the main gallery space, so sometimes I feel like it doesn't get quite as much of the love and attention that it deserves. Um, and have a think about those themes of wind and water and the environment and nature when you're looking at this case um, and, and have an idea maybe about what Barnes was trying to communicate there too. So if you haven't already, please subscribe to the Barnes Takeout and to get your daily serving of art um, and leave a comment. I really, really enjoy reading these and responding to, the, to them as well. So I hope you enjoyed this and take care and be safe. I'm Tom Collins, Neubauer Family Executive Director of the Barnes Foundation. I hope you enjoyed Barnes Takeout. Subscribe and make sure your post notifications are on to get daily servings of art. Thanks for watching and for your support of the Barnes Foundation.